wow, the last time Pam and I stood here, it was maybe with the idea that we would be standing here again. And here we are. Pam's over there in the corner. Was it my hands or my mouth that made that sound? I don't know. I'm excited. Um, a couple things you're going to learn about Pam and I is Pam's the more subdued one. That that doesn't mean she's any less passionate. I'm the more... There you go, that word. I'm that one. Um, and I'm actually really excited. And I have a, this thing I'm working on in my life. Um, the more excited I get, the faster I talk. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, there's this crazy thing, like, if you're nervous, excited, you talk fast. If you're super passionate about what you're excited, you're going to talk fast. And so if I get going too fast, it's just somebody just go, mm -hmm, and I'll get there. But I have this other thing. I'm just kind of warning you. Um, the more intensely strong I feel about something, sometimes I have this tendency to get really quiet. So if I get super quiet, it means I feel super serious about this, and then you need to give me a bump up sign, okay? So down means bring it in a little bit, slow down, and up means elevate the voice a little bit, okay? You all cue down that? So what's down mean? Slow down, and up means... Raise the volume. Okay. If you all get that, it'll save headaches for the sound tech um, because um, th I would, probably won't be looking back there all that often. All right. Well, as you can see this morning, we have another prop. I did not make this this morning. Unlike Rebecca, who slaved to bake bread for you last week, I did not make this in my spare time this weekend. Uh, this was purchased somewhere at a store. Um, and we are talking about the second I am statement. I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. If you brought a Bible this morning, whether physical or digital, I'm going to be using digital this morning. Um, it's part of one of those things that comes with age. When I was young enough to sit in this group, I thought that was just a bunch of hooey that, you know, when you get older, um, you need reading glasses. Um, and I'm like, what? But I needed the glasses as a kid anyways. Um, but now I'm finding that when I get older, I still need reading glasses, so I tend to use digital because I can make it the size I need. But we're going to turn to John chapter 8 this morning. John chapter 8 is going to be our text. And keep your finger there because we're going to be kind of floating through that space in that chapter. But as you're turning, let's pray. Jesus, I'm super excited because we get to learn more about you. And you gave us these amazing statements in your word, seven of them, that help us understand who you are as the Son of God. They help us understand who you are, and they help us understand your relationship to the Father, and then they help us understand what it means to follow you and the relationship that we get to have with you and the Father. And while I'm really excited this morning, Jesus, I'm also really passionately serious about what you want to accomplish in our lives this morning. Because I truly believe that as the light of the world, you are leading us on a journey from darkness into light, from slavery into freedom. You are leading us on a journey of deliverance. And I want to pray that anyone in this room this morning who needs to be set free from something that holds them back in their journey with you would experience freedom this morning. That there's, if there's somebody here who's struggling with what we often call a besetting sin, that they will find freedom this morning. If there's somebody watching online or watching somewhere in the future as this stays in the video archives, who's struggling, who wants to walk in freedom, even if it's just freedom from condemnation, that they will find that this morning. And I believe that your Holy Spirit is here to do something crazy, powerful, and amazing in our midst. And I just ask, Lord, that you would reveal your light today. In Jesus' name, amen. The I am statements of Jesus are so powerful and so crazy amazing. As Rebecca noted last week, the first I am statement, I am the bread of life, was kind of this little subversive statement. He's making a statement about who he is, but he's doing it in a way that allows the people to kind of catch up to speed with him. 
The second one that he makes in John chapter 8 is also somewhat that subversive, subtle, but not as subtle as the I am the bread of life statement, because he's going to build up to an I am statement that's just going to leave everyone wrecked with how they follow him. And you'll see in your notes, I put a, can you discover the hidden I am statement? We're going to give you the seven, but there's a hidden eighth I am statement in the book of John, and you'll find it in the tail end of chapter eight. That's the only spoiler I'm going to give you. But these two set the stage for that hidden one, and then uh, the ones on the other side, they're not hidden at all. And they force us to respond to Jesus in ways that we're not comfortable. And this morning, as excited as I am about this message, it's an excitement in the freedom that this message can bring and the freedom that Jesus wants to bring, but it's sometimes uncomfortable. When we confront Jesus for who he says he is, I have to change how I think about him. And it can't be on my terms. How many of you know that when we meet people, we form opinions about them or we have opinions of how our relationship with them is going to look, and that can go for a while. You know, that opinion we formed about them, it can work for a while. But then suddenly they do something or they say something about themselves that's like, wait a minute, I have to, re, I have to recalibrate how I see us. Because you just said something about you. You made a declaration about who you are and who you want to be in my life that I have to confront. I have to make a choice how I'm going to respond. Last week, Rebecca gave you, I'm the bread of life. And that's an easy one. I want to provide everything you need. I want to be the staple of your life. I want to be the the source of strength for you. How many of you could say, yes, that's an easy one to respond to. I want Jesus to be everything for me. But when he says, I am the light of the world, that's going to cause us to have a little bit of a response. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. We're going to start this morning in John chapter 8, verse 12, with a very simple statement. Jesus has been speaking in the temple, and he's been speaking during the Feast of Tabernacles. And he's going to come out with a really strong statement. In verse 12, it says, when Jesus spoke to the people, or when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. That's amazing. I want to read that again because it's so good. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus is making a promise of divine presence. It's no coincidence that Jesus is giving this description of himself during the Feast of Tabernacles. In the Feast of Tabernacles, the people of Israel had been commanded by the Lord from the time they left Egypt, way, way back, centuries before. They'd been commanded to commemorate their deliverance from a place of sin or bondage to slavery in Egypt with the Feast of Tabernacles. They were to... Spend a week in booths, in tabernacles, in tents. It was to to commemorate their leaving here, but the transition space to arriving here. How many of you have ever lived in a transition space? Some of you have been asking, are we settled in? No, we're not settled in, although our camper is parked at Steve and Cindy Beck's, and that's where we're staying until the house that we get to occupy opens up on September 1st. On September 1st, we'll be calling you and saying, hey, can you come help us move everything out of storage into a house? And then we'll get to settle in. But in the meantime, we're living in a temporary shelter, our camper. And it's cozy and it's got air conditioning, so don't worry when it gets 97 or 102. It, we'll be fine. We'll just be cranking the AC. But the people of Israel didn't have that. They just had their tents. And God wanted them to remember what it feels like to be on a journey from here to here. In between a place of slavery and a place of freedom. In between a place of bondage and a place of blessing. And he wanted them to remember how they got there. 
They got from here to there by following the Lord. Now, in Exodus chapter 13, if you want to just write this down, it tells us of God's miraculous presence to deliver, protect, and guide His people out of their bondage into the land of freedom. And it says this in Exodus 13, 21 and 22. By day the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. Isn't that crazy? How would you like to live with the permanently guiding presence of God right in the middle of your day. And for the people of Israel, when they were leaving Egypt in the place of bondage, and they were going to a place of freedom, a place they'd never been before, they needed to have that constant promise of presence. How do you get somewhere you've never gone? The age before Google. You have to follow the instructions of somebody who knows the way. And Jesus in this moment, as he stands in the temple and during the Feast of Tabernacles, is saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never dwell in darkness. Now, the people of Israel could have found darkness. They just needed to go away from the presence of God in the midst of them. But Jesus, and that's why Jesus is saying, You have to follow me. If you follow me, you will never walk in darkness. The first promise I want you to grab a hold of this morning is Jesus wants to be right in the middle of your day. Right in the middle of your experience. Right in the middle of that hard thing that you're dealing with that you don't know how to find a way through. Right in the middle of that struggle that you don't know how to conquer. Because he wants to lead you from a place of bondage to a place of peace. But you and I don't know how to get there on our own. We have to follow his guidance. And he has promised to be an ever-present guide. Day or night, whenever you need him, he is there. And he's here this morning. Jesus is making the promise to be present. He's making a commitment of himself to you. And see, isn't that the crazy thing about relationships is it takes a commitment from both parties. He's inviting us to follow him. That's our commitment. Jesus, I'm going to follow you. But he's committing himself to being there to be followed. You don't have to do this alone. Jesus evokes the the proven faithfulness of God in Israel's past because, again, they're commemorating a journey already completed. The people know. They have all the stories. They have all the psalms. They have the celebration of we once lived in captivity, and then God began to lead us out by this crazy pillar of cloud by day and fire by night, and he led us through the Red Sea, and then he led us through the desert, and then he, and in the desert he provided bread, the manna, every morning, so we were fed, and then he led us into a land of giants that we conquered. And he's faithfully protected us in the land of promise for generation upon generation upon generation of those who follow him. And Jesus is evoking that imagery of God's past faithfulness to give them hope in his faithfulness. Jesus will be faithful to you. Whether you've known him for a long time or whether you're considering a relationship with him, again, when we talk about a relationship, we wonder, will this commitment work? Here's the crazy thing. We might stray, we might wander, but he is faithful and true. He is faithful and true. 
The Pharisees who were hearing this challenged him, it says in verse 13. The Pharisees challenged him, saying, Here you are, appearing as your own witness. Your testimony is not valid. And you know, that's the crazy thing. When somebody says, this is who I am, we, only, we have to take their word for it. How do we know? How do you know Jesus will be faithful? How do you know Jesus will keep the promises? And again, Jesus is literally standing in the midst of people who are looking at him man to man, woman to man. They see him in his flesh. They see him in, in, in body. And they're like, how can we trust you? Jesus is going to give them several amazing statements. And here's the first one that captures my attention. Verse 14. Even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid, for I know where I came from and I know where I'm going. Now, you got to love that boldness. you got to love that boldness. Why can you trust me? Because I know where I came from and I know where I'm going. Later on in this passage in John, he's going to say, I came from above. I'm not of this world. There's, there's only, you have to trust him when he says that. Because <laughs> we can't go there to see him there we can only see him here. But you have to trust him. And Jesus honestly challenges us to trust him for who he says he is. He says, I know where I came from and I know where I'm going. Will you trust him this morning? Will you trust him to lead you to the place he's been and the place he's going back to? Because he's going to tell us, I came from the Father and I'm returning to the Father. If you and I want to get to the Father, if you and I want to get to God, we have to trust to one who came from him and returned to him. He's going to go on to say this, but you have no idea where I came from or where I'm going. You judge by human standards. I pass judgment on no one. But if I do judge, my decisions are true because I am not alone. I stand with the Father who sent me. Why can you trust Jesus? Because he stands with the Father. He stands with God. Now, I don't know about you, but there's, there's times in this world that we're living in where we're called to take a stand for something or with someone. And in this crazy world where people are constantly demanding we stand for this idea or that idea, we stand for this concept or for that ideology, Jesus isn't buying into any of that. Jesus has said, I am standing with the Father. So if we're going to follow Jesus where he is leading, he's going to lead us to a place where we can stand with the Father too. And I want you to know this, as, as Pam and I come in as your new co-pastors, we're not going to ask you to stand with man. We're not going to ask you to stand with a party. We're not going to ask you to stand with an ideology. We're going to ask you to stand with God. Take on his perspective. Take on his viewpoints. Take on his understanding. Because anything that we do here in this world, no matter how bright we are, it's flawed because it's seen through the eyes of man. And our decisions and our judgments are skewed. There's not one of us that can make the best choice, the right choice, all the time. Except for God. And if Jesus is going to lead us away from bondage, he's going to lead us away from the bondage of our own thinking and our own perceptions and our own understandings. And he's going to lead us to a place where we can say, I'm standing with God. I don't know about you, but that excites me. That excites me. He's going to, Jesus is going to go on to say that not only does he understand the Father's thinking, not only does he align with the Father's perspective and align with the Father's thought processes, but he literally, in verse 20, it says he only does and speaks what the Father taught him. Now, that's standing with somebody. I only do, I only say what the Father has taught me to say. That's alignment. 
And that's what Jesus is going to lead us into. Because this journey into the light is a journey of alignment with God. The other thing you're going to learn about us, just a little side note, is I suffer from allergies, and God decided it would be really fun to plant me in the middle of a thousand square feet of hay fields. <laughs> thousand square miles, excuse me. I mean, it's big, you know. There we go. My grace is sufficient. The one I love about Jesus is Jesus is going to tell us that not only does he do what the Father says and speaks what the Father taught him, not only is he going to say, I stand with the Father, but can you capture what the verb tense of that is? Eric would be able to tell us really quick. I've already learned Eric's the word master. He says, I stand with the Father. What's that mean? Present tense. That means Jesus is telling the people, wherever you see me, you see the Father standing right with me. I am with him constantly. Jesus is going to tell us he walks in the continuous presence of the Father. And Jesus' actions align with the Father's pleasure. And this is the crazy thing. As you go through the book of John, and we'll encourage you to read through it in the bits and pieces, because there's no way we could cover it all in these I am statements. One of the promises of Jesus is that the Father and Christ himself would always walk with us. So even though Jesus is saying, come and follow me, he's literally saying, come and, come and hang out with the Father and I. We're going to have a party. Wherever, wherever I am, the Father is, and if you want to follow with me, we get to hang out together, all of us. And I don't know if you realize that when you came into this building this morning or not, but the presence of God came with you if you're following Jesus. And it just multiplied as we gathered as Christ followers. That's one of the reasons why we come together is because in these moments, I mean, Jesus said as it happens, where two or three gather together, there I am in their what? Midst. What happens when there's 80 of us or 90 of us or 100 of us or 1,000 of us? It just almost like exponentially multiplies the presence of God. And we come together to worship this Jesus together. I want you to note something very clearly in verse 19. Because as Jesus gives testimony to himself and he's walking him through, this is why you can trust me. They said, well, they asked him, where is your father? You don't know me or my father, Jesus replied. If you knew me, you would know my father also. I want you to capture this. Jesus clearly ties the importance of knowing and trusting him directly to our relationship with God. To know Jesus is to know the Father, and this is the core truth of John's gospel. To know Jesus is to know the Father. Do you want to know God? Get to know Jesus. Get to know Jesus. Now, I mentioned that this is a journey from bondage to freedom, and Jesus is not calling us and he's not talking about nominal belief or casual acquaintance. Because there's a difference between, oh, I know somebody. Really? Do you really know him? Oh, yeah. Well, tell me about him. Well, um, he's tall. Um, you really know him? Well, I, I met him once. We had a conversation for a few minutes. There's a difference between a casual encounter with somebody... There's a difference between a casual acquaintance with somebody and following and learning to know somebody. And Jesus is not inviting us into a casual acquaintance. When he offers to be the light of the world and those who follow him will never dwell in darkness, but have the light of life, this isn't about coming in and out, kind of hanging out for a little bit. Oh, Jesus is kind of cool. He's literally calling us to a committed relationship with him. Let's jump down in chapter 8. Verse 31, to the Jews who believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you're really my disciples. A disciple is kind of this crazy word 
In some ways, it means to follow. In other ways, the best way of describing it is to be a learner. A disciple is somebody who follows a teacher in order to learn from them, not just what they teach, but how they live. Jesus called his disciples by what? He said, follow me. That meant leaving where they were. That meant stepping away from the life they've been living and literally following Jesus around. And then following him from town to town, into the wilderness, into the desert, along the roads, they would walk with him and talk with him. They'd eat around a fire with him. They would discover his sense of humor. And I truly think Jesus has an amazing sense of humor. I mean, come on, look at us. <laughs> Guys, how many of you have had to f- discover that hair moved from here to other places? I mean, God has a sense of humor. God chuckles all the time. But the more you spend time with somebody, the more you really get to know somebody. And the invitation to follow Jesus is literally an invitation to live your life with him. Why? To learn from him. To learn to emulate him. To learn to grow like him. To learn to see things from his perspective. To learn to understand things from his understanding. And in this moment, he says, if you hold to my teaching, you're really my disciple, and then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. This is where the light gets scary. This is where it gets a little more serious. It gets a little scarier. Because as we learn Jesus' way of doing life, it doesn't line up with the way I was taught to do life. And I have to let go of my past understandings. Every single one of us is literally in an an intercultural journey of discovery. Because none of us were born or raised in a culture that looks like Jesus's. Because where did Jesus come from? From the Father. From heaven, right? We are all in the process of learning heaven's culture. Every one of us. It's not like we have to go to China or Argentina or Korea or somewhere in the world or Kenya to discover a different culture that we have to grapple with. Every one of us who meets Jesus is encountering somebody who was raised in a different culture, so to speak, came from a different culture and is calling us to live according to that culture's rules. And that's where it gets hard because we were raised in a different culture. We were raised in a different home. We were raised in a different belief system. And it doesn't always line up with the kingdom's. And how many of you know that if you break the law of another country just because you didn't know about that law doesn't mean you're not guilty? Now I get it. It's easy for us. If we go to Great Britain, we understand which side of the road are we going to drive on. Some of you are going, the wrong side? (laughs) Probably. (laughs) Because they drive on what side of the road as compared to us? The left. But just because we're American and we're like, well, we're sorry, we just got here and we're still figuring out the rules doesn't mean we're not guilty if we drive on the wrong side of the road to them, but it's the right side to us. And that's the crazy thing about sin sometimes. We live in a culture that taught us that certain things were okay, certain things were normal, certain things were right. But that doesn't mean that they're right in the kingdom. And Jesus, in this moment, when he begins to say, if you really want to follow me, you have to follow my teaching. You have to become my disciple. You have to understand what I'm saying. But if you do, you're going to come to know the truth. Not what the world tells you is true. Not what your culture told you is true. Not what other people think is true. Not what you thought was true. But what God says is true. And in that moment, there's going to be a collision between God's truth and what we thought was true. And then there's going to be a moment of choice. But this is what's going to bring us freedom. Jesus is asking us to follow him. 
In some ways, Jesus is fulfilling the prophecy spoken by Zechariah given at the birth of John the Baptist in Luke 1, 78 and 79, where it says, Because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. The beauty of this invitation from Jesus is found in its fullness or completion. Completeness. You and I are called from death into life. We are called from deception into truth. We are called from slavery into sonship. We are called from bondage into freedom. Many of the people that are listening to Jesus are just like us today going, well, we're not slaves to anything. What are you talking about? How can you say we need to be set free? In verse 34, it says, Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I want to invite the worship team to come back up. It takes courage to walk in the light. Some of you might have been thinking as we turn to chapter 8, wait a minute, you're skipping over the whole story of the woman caught in adultery. No, I'm just going to speak to it now. I don't think it's an accident that that event is what preceded Jesus saying, I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. Because that whole scenario, that whole picture is a picture of Jesus being the light. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law caught a woman in adultery and they bring her before Jesus and they make her stand in front of Jesus and they say, teacher, the law tells us that we're to stone a woman like this. And if you read the beginning part, now I invite you to do that in your own time, Jesus bends down and begins to write in the dust with his finger. And it says they kept pressing him for an answer. What are we going to do? Should we pick up a rock? Should we stone her? Are you going to stone her? And Jesus just makes a statement. Let him who's without sin cast the first stone. And goes back to writing in the dirt. Now the passage tells us that the oldest ones in the crowd figured it out first. So if you've got a little gray hair and you're... you're maybe a little ahead of the game in some ways. But they slowly began to leave, followed by the youngest, until no one was willing to say, I'm without sin, I can throw a rock. And then it says, Jesus is left standing there with this woman, and he looks at her and he says, woman, where are your accusers? Where are those who condemn you? And she says, there's no one. He says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Leave your life of sin. And I think this story shows us the beautiful truth of what it means to be confronted by the light. If there's hidden sin in your heart that no one knows about but you, God sees it. And you know it's there. And he wants to deal with it. If there's something that's holding you in bondage, God wants you to walk in freedom. But to step into the light means being confronted with that truth. But for the woman caught in adultery, the truth she needed to be confronted by was there was no condemnation. Whether it was the Pharisees or the woman caught in adultery, they all had a choice of what path they were going to put their feet to as they walked away from that moment. The Pharisees could begin to put their faith in Jesus, although they resisted. The woman who had heard Jesus explain to her, I do not condemn you, was given a choice, but now how do you want to live your life after here? And that's what this moment is about. That's what this moment is about for us. Anytime we gather, there's always a choice before us. What are we going to do? 
Anytime we hear the word of God and the truth of God, anytime Jesus begins to speak to our hearts, there's always a moment where the light is shining and we get to choose what we're going to do in that moment. What path will we walk from here forward? Are we going to go back to whatever was hidden, to whatever sin resides somewhere in some space unknown to us or known to us and others? Or are we going to choose to step another step on the path of peace, another step of the step of life, another step on the path of righteousness and freedom. Jesus came to set you free. And here's maybe the greatest truth that some of you need to hear this morning. You are not a slave to sin any longer. The Apostle Paul will pick up on this narrative in Romans 6, 7, and 8. And he will give us this truth that so many of us need to hear. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the old order passed away. That's in Corinthians. But in Romans, he will tell us, you are no longer to a slave to sin. You do not have to obey it any longer. You can walk in truth. So this morning, as we return into a time of worship... I want to ask, give you a chance to respond. And there are going to be four ways that I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond. One, this space in the front of the sanctuary is often referred to as an altar. In the Old Testament, the altar was a place where you came to do business with God. If you had sinned, you came and brought your sacrifice that would bring forgiveness. It was a place of restoring fellowship. You could bring a fellowship offering that said, God, you and I are good, right? Yeah, we're good. It's a place of worship. Now, we don't have to come and bring a sacrifice because Jesus became the sacrifice for us. But you and I sometimes need to, to, to grab a hold of that sacrifice again. And we need to come before the Lord and say, God, I'm sorry. I've been sinning and I want to experience your grace and forgiveness. And so this altar space is a space where we can come and do business with God. And as Riker leads us in worship, if you want to slip out of your seat and come and kneel or stand and have that moment with Jesus, that's fine. We're also going to be, give you a chance to respond in another way. Pam and Rebecca are going to come over to this side and they're going to be a prayer team. And Jeff... And another gentleman are going to come to this side and they're going to stand and they're going to be a prayer team. Because sometimes we need to take a step of faith and we need to actually let somebody know, I'm making a decision for Jesus today. Even if that decision is just God speaking to my heart about this and I don't want it controlling me anymore. Would you pray with me that I'll find freedom? I'll find deliverance in Christ. We want you to know there's somebody who will hold your story confidentially and they're going to commit to pray with you. And Jesus is going to be in that space. So if you're a part of that prayer team, would you just come to those places? The third way I'm going to give you a chance to respond is right where you're at. Because the crazy thing is, is when the Pharisees left that moment, no one knew what was going on in their hearts. And we do not know anything about the woman who was caught in adultery, who Jesus gave this beautiful invitation to. What they did and how they walked their path was between them and God. And the pages of Scripture do not record it for anyone else to know. And maybe this morning you're going to have a conversation with Jesus right where you're at. And that's okay. If you want to take a connection card and fill it out, and say, George, Pam, would you pray with me? This is the decision I made and put it in that black box. We'll pray with you. We'll, if you want us to reach out to you, just mark, put a note on there. Please call me. I want to talk with you about this. We'll do it privately later on. Or it can just be just between you and Jesus. I don't want anyone to feel a sense of shame. But I want us to have the freedom to respond to the Lord this morning. Because I truly believe it. For some of you, there is a journey of deliverance that can start right now, today. 
that sin, that habit, that thought process, that way of thinking about yourself or about others that you carried from your past, it can be, its power can be broken and a new way can begin today as you step into the light. But that takes courage. So I want to invite you, be a people of courage. Walk in the light today. Would you stand with us?